Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the main stage um, for this panel discussion. Um, my name is Richard Mayton from Aperio Strategy and the International Reg Tech Association, and I'm delighted to be moderating this discussion uh, into some of the issues around how do we develop effective governments, trust frameworks, uh, the standards um, and the design for security and privacy that we need to really um, implement and grow digital identity systems. I kind of come to this discussion, um, have work around the digitalization of KYC, both existing controls and processes, but also importantly, how do we build utilities and shared services? We looked at some best practice examples um, of, that have worked and some that have, haven't around the world. And I think there definitely are some common uh, lessons um, that we can draw upon. And I'm delighted uh, that we will be joined in this discussion today with some practitioners who really are at the forefront of working through these challenges and issues um, and implementing systems as well. So um, I'm going to let our panelists um, introduce themselves shortly. If you do have questions, please enter them into the chat as we go through. Go through. Um, and um, you know, we look forward to a fan, you know, fantastic, um, engaging conversation. So first of all, Robert, could you just say a, a, a few brief words about yourself? Thank you very much. I'm Robert Bohr, the founder and CEO of Keepable. We're privacy SaaS, helping people put in place a privacy framework for compliance with GDPR. Fantastic. Uh, Vicky. Hi, everybody. I'm Vicky Manaila, uh, Cloud Signature Consortium uh, board member, uh, working within the uh, digital identity and digital signature uh, framework for the past 15 years. Uh, Why well, I'm here today uh, to present um, our uh, approach, our commitment for having open standards and interoperability that are fundamental for digital identities uh, framework. Fantastic. And Manuela. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Manuela and I represent Banco Santander. Uh, I'm based in London and for the last couple of years I've been driving mm -hmm the digital identity and digital trust topic, more broadly speaking, uh, here in the UK, but also globally. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here today and share some of my experiences. Well, very well, welcome. And Don. Hi, I'm Don Cardinal, Managing Director and Chief Cat Herder of Financial Data Exchange. We're an international nonprofit standards body dedicated to unifying the financial community around a common, interoperable, royalty-free standard for the consumer permission sharing of financial data. Glad to be here. Yep, fantastic, Don. And lastly, Brad. Don't know that I can quite match the cat herder description there that Don gives, which I think is a, a great one. Uh, but I'm Brad Carr. I'm the Managing Director of Digital Finance at the Institute of International Finance, or IIF. And really, as we look across the, the digital economy in the co-COVID or post-COVID world, we've really seen digital identity emerge probably alongside cloud as one of the really key foundational technologies for the industry. So we've launched the, the Open Digital Trust Initiative together with the Open ID Foundation. And that's uh, part of what I uh, will probably touch on as part of our discussion. Fantastic. Well, thank you all very much. And, um, you know, and I think what came across from those introductions is just the, you know, the breadth and the depth of your collective experience. But I'm going to, Brad, I'm going to turn to you, you first, because, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with your open digital trust initiative that you, you mentioned, um, as, as somebody who participates, you know, in that, in that initiative in a, in a small way and been very impressed by, by how you've set about that work, you know, systematically trying to address um, through a collaborative approach um, with institutions, or with standard setters um, and different organizations at the forefront and working digital entity to address some of those issues from, from you know, trust frameworks through to interoperability and standards. And I just wonder if you could give us a little bit more information about, you know, what are you trying to solve through your initiative and, and, and how you set about that and what you think some of the key are that we need to work on in, through this kind of collaborative approach that you've fostered. Well, Richard, if I, if I probably step back and, and start with some of the, the use cases, and I think the really compelling use case for me is 
about enabling small businesses to be able to participate in the digital economy. You know, we've had such a dramatic trend of, of uh, the accelerated adoption of e-commerce over the last 12 months. And small businesses are trying to reinvent themselves to be able to participate in the economy in that way. But of course, for some products and services, it's not enough just to establish that your customer has money. Uh, you also need to establish that they are in some way an eligible customer, uh, that they might need to meet a, an age criterion, for instance. Like when I'm ordering beer from a, a craft brewery as, as one example, one common example. Um, so the in each of those online transactions, online interactions, you know, you have the consumer that might not want to pass their raw personal data. Equally, I think you've got a small business merchant that really doesn't want to have to receive all of the raw personal data that they then need to protect, uh, protect and secure uh, under the threat of extensive fines or, or reputational loss. So I think there's a, a really important need to be able to bring forward the, the ability to connect the different players in the ecosystem um, to create an open network that anyone can, can participate in where the customer can instruct their registered verifier, their trusted verifier, and whether that's their bank or their telco or their energy retailer, somebody who has previously verified them to a, a high standard, that where the customer can instruct that party to be able to pass through an answer that meets the merchant's, the merchant's criteria. Not the raw data, but the yes or no answer that the merchant needs to that eligibility question through a, a network of secure APIs. So that's you know that's the the really compelling use case that draws me in, and and the key to making this work then is about interoperability, uh, and that's why I think it's it's really important where we've had the Open ID Foundation leading on the technical standards, while we at the IIF have focused alongside that on the policy framework, and we've really found the importance of interoperability really comes across I think at three levels. You know when we first embarked on this exercise, I naively approached interoperability thinking interoperability with other identity systems. And you've got some great ones. You've got the bank ID system in the Nordic countries. You've got the, the Verify Me work that SecureKey and DIAC have, have led in Canada. You've got a few national innovations like in Singapore. So we don't wanna be duplicative or reinventing the wheel, uh, but instead we think there's a role to help in, in linking some of those up and allowing others to connect in and out of those. But secondly, I quickly found it's, it's not just about interoperability with other identity systems, it's also interoperability with other key functions uh, throughout the, the financial sector, in payments, in things like open banking or open finance and open insurance, things like national KYC databases. And then perhaps to layer on the, the third level, I think it's, it's in, increasingly important that this is about cross-sectoral integration. Um, you're not gonna get take up from, from users if you're thinking of your industry purely in a vacuum. And rather you need to be able to have an identity structure that's accessible to them across each of the different walks of life where they might want to use it. So we in finance can't approach this in a vacuum. You know, we need to be thinking alongside those in health, in travel. Um, it's gonna be about what you can do that works together with vaccine passports in the, the near term how you're going to be able to get into a concert, your university records, your tax records, etc. So, you know, if I draw those strands together, um, you know, Richard, I think it's really about how do we, you know, we need to have principles and standards and designs that are interoperable with basically everything else that the customer might want to use. Absolutely. Um, you know, and I, and I think, I think that's such an important point you make about how you think about interoperability and link that to value and the value you create for everybody in that ecosystem as well into that design you know and, and another key area where you know i continue to do some work is around that digital identity is a kind of foundational for more effective you know uh, f um, security and safety particularly when it comes to fin crime as well and that seems to be another um, key driver to put into that um, in that mix you know and i think you're the issue around consumer design and, and consumer take up is key. Um, one of those find one of the findings from our research is that um, some of these initiatives that have perhaps been sexual focus, um, you know, they do need to overcome some scepticism. Clearly, in some in some countries around identity generally, but digital identity as well. Um, and the more compelling you make. Um, the value of that to individuals and businesses, plus the, the safety and security um, within that system, um, the, the more successful you're likely to be. And that's been that's been played out um, clearly in those um, uh, you know, those examples that have been successful. 
successfully deployed, designed and deployed as well. Um, Vicky, let's come to you on this issue around interoperability. So, um, you know, given all your your, your experience um, around identity systems and standards, uh, particularly at an EU level, I think um, one of the key issues that needs to pull together all of these factors for success is, is a clear kind of policy, you know, goals and statements, but also practical work. And it was, you know, incredibly encouraging to see uh, in the EU's digital finance um, um, strategy and recommendations and actions that were published last year, this um, focus on interoperability between various EU identity schemes and also design of those specifically for EKYC. I wonder whether you could maybe talk us through how you see that work developing. What are the main kind of challenges and opportunities in that as it relates to this key issue of interoperability? Uh, well, as you probably know, uh, and as um, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, the president of European Commission, announced uh, last year, there is a, a process of revision of the uh, EU IDAS regulation, especially regarding the electronic identity uh, section. And um, the uh, the direction is to have a new ID framework uh, with um, uh, three um, fundamental principles. Uh, one is to, to give universal access for electronic identity. So uh, citizens, um, so the digital identities for citizens uh, will uh, have an improved availability. Uh, another principle is uh, the usability. Uh, so the uh, legal electronic identity should uh, should be able to uh, to be used by the citizen uh, cross borders, and of course, last but not least, uh, data protection. And we have different actors in this uh, within this framework. Uh, we we'll, uh, we have ID providers. Uh, trust service providers, uh, online service providers, public authorities, and of course, uh, at the center of, uh, of the whole picture uh, is the citizen, because he will benefit uh, and uh, he will take the most of, uh, from this um, uh, new framework. Uh, now, uh, what is the connection between a Cloud Signature Consortium and Electronic Identity? Uh, we in Cloud Signature Consortium have uh, started with deploying an open standard for cloud-based digital signatures. But at the, um, at the base of the, uh, cloud, um, um, of the cloud signature, um, is the identity because uh, we cannot speak about digital without identity. We cannot uh, have trust within online processes, uh, in um, interactions between uh, people that are not uh, meet each other without knowing for sure who is who is the dog on the internet. Um, um, remembering the famous carton of um, uh, 1998. And um, the open standard we have developed for uh, cloud-based signature um, has, um, has a such a success because it was uh, being adopted by different uh, public institutions, uh, um, by uh, service providers, technology providers across the, the world. So we will continue um, with our efforts in deploying also um, standards, open standards for digital identity, how to check the identity, because this is uh, um, fundamental, um, uh, how we can check the identities uh, without burden the users, without having longer process and uh, assuring a smooth user experience for for the benefit of everyone thank you thank you vicky that's a great um example of why you know a digital id is a foundation right for so many additional um yeah. beneficial services um such as e-signatures um I, you know i, I just reflecting a little bit on that challenge of of standardizing and identity and attributes one you know again one of the issues that comes through is 
when it comes to digital identity, particularly, obviously, particularly for financial services, is um, consistency in definitions uh, or the problem, the challenge of inconsistencies in definitions and uh, between member states um, that, that causes the challenge with interoperability and standardization. Um, I mean, how do, you, how do you see the EU's current scope of work you know, practically trying to solve some of those issues? Um, well, um, the, it will be also a process of standardization of uh, different activities and uh, services uh, to be in order to get access uh, to this EU uh, EID infrastructure. There are standardization mm -hmm. body as um, European Telecommunication Standard Institute and ENISA that have mandate from European Commission in uh, building and developing standards, but also associations as Cloud Signature Consortium um, have their contribution because our standard ha has been referenced directly by European Telecommunication Standard Institute as being uh, uh, comp bring, bringing compliance to EU EIDAS uh, regulation. So um, all the actors, be that um, electronic identity provider, governmental uh, authority providing master electronic identity, or um, providers of verified credentials, they should comply with those standards. They should be certified, accredited as being compliant with those standards, and uh, they could uh, uh, work together uh, within this uh, framework of EU identities, which is great because being uh, compliant with standards gives trust to the citizens and to the consumers that your services are um, according uh, to those uh, uh, regulatory requirements, that you are assuring um, a highest security level and um, also bring interoperability because in the end we are talking about trust and interoperability. We cannot keep everything uh, closed uh, with a locker and uh, shut down and we have security in that way. It doesn't make any sense for anybody. Absolutely. And and you keep and you know, everyone keeps coming coming back to you know what, what what's the outcome for people and what's that trusted environment in which is to operate. So and we'll come on to talk a little bit more about you know how you how you deliver that um, as we go through the discussion. So, so maybe now, Don, it'd be great to understand um, some more about the work that you're doing um, around developing op these open standards for exchanging you know, financial services data and where you see that work fitting in and enabling this interoperability um, for digital identity. No, and I appreciate that. And I owe, owe Vicky a uh, beverage for all the good intros about putting the citizen or the customer first, because that's really what we talk about a market driven or market led solution. But honestly, it's customer centric, but it's subject to market discipline. And the other point she mentioned is having different actors involved. And that's, I think, one of the unique things about FDX. Um, our consortium is a big tent. We not only have the banks, insurance companies, and investment firms, but we also have small fintechs. Half our members are in our smallest dues tier. Uh, we also have academics, we have consumer groups. And one of the things we found is best idea wins is a great mantra for developing a common standard. So it really doesn't matter your market cap. If two young ladies in a garage, uh, we're just coming off of uh, International Women's Day, uh, have a new idea and they can put forward a change in our spec, they convince the consortium and it goes in. Uh, and it's worked rather well. We have 12 million users who've already converted to FDX away from held away credentials and screen scraping. Then one of the other things we wanted to do is focus on common purpose. A lot of our members compete with and against each other trying to serve the customer. And we're able to bring together almost 175 organizations to work on this thing voluntarily and pay money to do it because we're focused on their market need to serve a common customer. And we all agree it's the common customer. And when you're trying to take care of that person through the entire journey, it really gives you a lens to solve problems. Uh, another advantage we, we have is we're not tied to any one jurisdiction or government. Uh, again, so we are in Canada, North America primarily, that's because where most of our members are, but we have members on four mm -hmm. continents and we are working to make it fit for purpose in any jurisdiction. We like to think as we talk to regulators and around the world, to be honest, um, we let them focus on the what. What do you want? What, what, what outcome do you want? 
but leave the how to industry. Why? The industry and their technologists, their engineers are more nimble and they have the most skin in the game. They're closest to the customer. They have to take care of the customer for their daily bread. So that's important. Now, when you have a big tent, the only way you get value is by having interoperable standards they can all share. And that's one of the neat things about this um, is interoperability drives so many other use cases. We're starting to see other things daisy chained off of FDX, for example, we're primarily around getting rid of screen scraping held away credentials. In North America, we estimated there were around 100 million IDs and passwords floating around out there. Why? For years, it was the only way to do things. Now we're 12 million, that's great. We have another 80 million left to go. But the idea being that everyone wants to move to the next new thing. So when we looked around about you know, what worked, look at ideas like Bluetooth, where it was completely voluntary, but everyone agreed, wouldn't it be great if your, your phone or your uh, headset could talk wirelessly. You look at EMV card. Wouldn't it be great if we got away from Magstripe and all the security issues with that? And we're seeing a similar sort of adoption. As long as we stay focused on taking care of the customer, taking care of business, we're seeing an incredible amount of growth. Our, actually, our adoption curve is way better than EMV and uh, Bluetooth was. So we're looking forward to that. But we have to stay focused on the customer and taking care of them. But again, we have the unique opportunity that we're not subject to any one government, so we can just build the best mousetrap. Now, with that, we have to stay away from policy. We don't comment on policy. We don't comment on legislation. And quite honestly, we're very happy about that. So I know you had some other questions, but um, that's effectively what we're doing. And we're open yep. to anybody to come join. Great. Brad, I, I know you had some thoughts around, you know, um, particularly the I think some of those key points from from Don that we see as drivers in kind of open finance initiatives more generally, right around the world. Well, I think we we have seen on initiatives like open banking in different jurisdictions, mm. perhaps extending beyond into open finance, that the, the general level mm. of take up in most places has been pretty low. And there's a number mm. of reasons for that, but one of them is this disparate range of different approaches that aren't always mm. uh, readily uh, connectable. Uh, and in some cases, that's been a challenge for a, a new small player that they've had to go and interface with so many different alternate versions. Uh, there's the own uh, security issues that can emerge from all of that. So I think it's really important that we as an industry are able to convalesce around standards and principles that, that help to uh, probably get past a lot of those challenges. And I think that's a really vital piece towards take up. Um, occasionally, you'll hear somebody suggest that government should impose the particular standard. And I think you know, most governments, I think, quite understandably have been very reluctant to do that and rather taken a view that they should be technology neutral. Um, so I think in that context, it, it really is contingent upon us in the industry to step up and be able to uh, arrange ourselves and convalesce ourselves around standards and principles. So I think the work that, that people like FDX with people like uh, like Don and, and also the Open ID Foundation are each doing is, is really important work that is really doing a great service for us all. Yeah, I, it, those are really interesting points. I think again, one of the um, the key findings is is getting from our our research into what works and doesn't work and where those barriers are. That there are certainly instances where you've had more of a government led approach, and that's created some challenges when it hasn't been industry and more bottom up. Um, um, and also, I you know I don't absolutely agree with the issue around ensuring that you know all members within a consortium approach have access to and can can use um, those standards and systems right around that as well. And again, that's been problematic when the design's been a bit top down versus bottom up as well. So that that resonates, I think, really well. I guess one, of, I guess one of the one of the issues, Don, I guess, is you know, how do you uh, as these systems grow? How, you know, what what do you think the mechanism is to ensure that the the interoperability of standards, you know, um, between uh, exists between different. Uh, um, sure. Um, models that are being developed. Sure. I mean, Brad alluded to this uh, earlier, the like OpenID Foundation, for example. They have a great mm -hmm. tool in their OIDC extension onto OAuth 2. So why reinvent the wheel? Uh, we know it as FAPI, and they're busy working on FAPI 2. You should go check them out. So we have a very yeah. good relationship with them. And so we've adopted FAPI as part of our authentication stack because, again, we were able to shop the planet and, and look at what works. Um, and when you see groups, and if you look, fappy has been adopted in Australia, UK, I believe uh, the Berlin group will be adopting it soon. So 
if you see authentication standardized and you see everyone using RESTful APIs, everyone using JSON request response, realistically, all you have left are really the data containers. And if you want to borrow a metaphor of containerized commerce, it really doesn't matter if you see that cargo ship, if it's a red container or a blue container, they all stack up together rather nicely. And I think that's kind of where we're headed, um, to borrow a metaphor, if you will. Great, fantastic. Okay, um, I'm just gonna, uh, the point you made was around the consortium, the role of collaboration. Now, you know, meanwhile, Banco Santero has kind of been doing some fantastic work um, around creating some standards of its own um, or with the industry um, around APIs for secure financial you know, exchange of financial information um, and as a trusted provider of identity and verification. Could you tell us a little bit about that work and, and how you see financial institutions playing su uh, such a key role in this ecosystem? Um, absolutely. So um, in order for a digital economy to thrive, we need to ensure secure user authentication and enable safe and secure transfer of data. Uh, now, banks are in a unique position because we already are trusted partners of our customers. Uh, we store valuable data about, uh, you know, their the personal data, and we are in charge of keeping the money safe. Uh, we've established that relationship, but we also verify these customers. We know who they are. We've done our bit. We know we've done the due diligence and we've got the data, which we could share with the broader community. Now, from my personal experience, I, I always look at this from two sides, right? So there is some data we have, but the more data, the better, right? We cannot rely just on, just on the data that bank has because, you know, we need a combination of identifiable attributes uh, to make it a safer marketplace. Because you know, one 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 attribute can easily be tampered. However, you know, a set of them is is a lot harder to tamper. So we look at things like you know, what what the customer knows, right? It's the passwords, the pins, security codes. Uh, what does the customer own or have? Um, identity cards or bank cards. Uh, who the customer is. And this is interesting because this is more related to biometrics. So that's spanning physical, but also behavioral features. So let's say, yes, we, you know, um, the phone can identify your face, but also are you typing the message in the right speed? Is that the way of, you know, your normal behavior, the way you click, the way you behave? So these are interesting parts that could give us, you know, more understanding of who you are and whether you are who you claim to be at that moment in time, but also let's say where the customer is. Um, so, you know, collaborating with, let's say uh, mobile companies, right? The mobile number, the geolocation, the IP address, social network size. So um, I guess the, the, the key point here is that we need as much data as possible to make it a safe marketplace, but we also need a wider industry adoption. So we need cross sector involvement to drive the digital economy. Uh, financial services cannot do this alone and enabling uh, digital identity and digital trust is, is a common effort. Now, uh, we at Santander have been involved in, in a couple of initiatives. So one thing uh, that we did is we open sourced a digital trust protocol. Um, so it's a set of rules and specifications for developers to work on. And uh, it's been built on top of open ID uh, principles. And, uh, you know, it includes information like uh, security profiles, uh, level of assurances, uh, assertion claims, um, proofs. We also have a sandbox. So this, this is all public information. And we really want to, you know, we want to extend the work that has been done and enable, you know, other people to engage in a more easier manner. Um, at the same time, we've been involved with, with Brad and the um, IAF together with Open ID Foundation on the Open Digital Trust Initiative, uh, right? Which is, uh, we're trying to facilitate um, an industry-wide policy and, and, and technical standards in order to define interoperable and open uh, standards. And there's, there's a long list 
of, of, of uh, sets that we could go through. But I think these are the two really key initiatives where we're trying to, uh, you know, not just work within the bank, but also engage with, with the wider community. Absolutely. So, so Brad, well, I mean, you're you're picking up some of this great work um, by Banco Santander into your initiative. How, I mean, how, how do you view the role of banks right, as the um, the trusted provider uh, of identity, and and then how and then how do you facilitate that that work and work of other members through your initiative to, I guess, ultimately to yeah. adoption. Yeah, I mean, look, we've we've built quite a wide community both across our yeah. our membership base of banks and insurers worldwide, as well as yeah. a number of the the leading uh, identity tech firms and the like. Uh, and I really do need to single out Manuela and, and also her colleague Rod Boothby, who spoke earlier on mm -hmm. today's program from Santander, who have really been the intellectual leaders, uh, I think, across the, the financial industry in this space. Um, I had a chuckle at Manuela's point about um, you know, picking up the other data points of, of you know, the, the speed that you type at and so on. And I'm fascinated with the things that you see from the Amazon Kindle app about your reading speed, for instance. Um, as Manuela says, the more of these different sources that we can bring together, the, the better. But the point I probably most wanted to make about about banks and their place in this ecosystem is, you know, we need to to see. Uh, I said at the outset that the digital identity is one of the the major foundational technologies for the industry now, and we need to see this in the wider context of the digital economy, where there is intensified competition around data and how data is used. Uh, I think banks have a tremendous position of of trust um, in terms of their history and their record of data protection. You know, the, uh, there was a fascinating report by the Bank of England about 18 months ago, which included a, a section on, on data, the, the Future of Finance report. And they talked about how 86% of people when surveyed, who do you most trust with your personal data? 86% said their bank, whereas the other 14 were scattered across social media companies, tech firms, telcos and the, the like. So there's a tremendous position that, that banks have. And it throws up a question, I think, for banks in their strategies of, of how can you leverage that trust to support your strategic objectives, whilst at the same time ensuring that you continue to value and protect that position of trust, that you don't jeopardise it. Um, it can be a, a powerful competitive differentiator, but only if you preserve and protect that position. And I think digital identity presents really a, a tremendous opportunity for banks and insurers to be able to leverage that safely and securely in a way that can deliver some material customer benefit. And it really, uh, I think, is, is central for how a bank can remain relevant to their customer in this modern world. Uh, it becomes a really central part of a financial institution's customer value proposition. Seen it at a time when, when customers' expectations, uh, I think, across all industries are, are raising, as they've had experiences, particularly through the, the COVID and work from home era, the way that we're streaming our entertainment and the like. The customer experience expectations, that bar has raised. And I think the leveraging of the existing record that banks have in protecting data as a means of enabling the identity service that can help unlock a lot of that safely and securely, I think is a really important proposition. And you know, the more forward leaning banks like Santander, uh, I think are commended uh, for, for grabbing that opportunity. Absolutely. Um, just gonna, because um, we keep coming back to this issue of trust and the trust by the, 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 the owner of their identity. Um, um, and Robert, you know, it'd be fantastic to get your view around you know, what kind of frameworks do you think we should be designing and implementing to ensure that trust is, you know, protected and secure, particularly when it comes to issues around privacy and, you know, obligations around personal identifiable information. Absolutely. And one of the there's benefits of coming along here advantages in terms of I want to reply to so much of what's been said because it's all been so uh, so spot on. But yeah. for example, when Brad said a lot of SMEs are not able to look after this sort of level of information and how much information should go. It should just be the yes, no, not the full information. In the UK we had a bit of a fiasco with the uh, track and trace for pubs and restaurants should they have to do they have to do they not what was what was a mandated what wasn't um, how they collected it was pretty awful they used it for another purpose so people were having being put on email marketing list and then some nefarious purposes as well so 
the UK Information Commissioner's Office gave a really good report into the DCMS in September 19 on digital ID and was underpinning has to be transparency, accountability, and that's all part of privacy uh, data protection by default and data protection by design, which actually was a Canadian initiative uh, back in the day and is now enshrined in. So if you look at data protection by design and by default, you have to look at the risk to the individual. So this conversation has been fantastic because it's all about the individual. And it's quite a weird one for a lot of enterprises because most enterprise risk, you're looking at the risk to the enterprise. Whereas here, it really, it really is all about that risk to the individual. And you only need to see the um, reactions to the recent um, track and trace for pubs and restaurants here, for example, and compare it to news. The Privacy Commissioner took a very proactive stance and was giving privacy safe badges to different um, solutions, not not sort of recommending solutions, but saying that their practices were respectful. And so I think regulators like the ICO are very keen on seeing the private sector bring this forward, obviously implementing IDAS and the uh, iterations of that, but with that data protection uh, by design and by default. Policies, procedures, data minimization, which is possibly the opposite view from earlier, uh, actually bring in things like, like biometrics and more data, make it more uh, difficult to make an interoperable standard because the rules on that can be very different uh, everywhere else. Biometrics is one of the special categories under GDPR. So privacy by design and default at the base of it, security, accountability, trust, it comes from that transparency of all of that. And data minimization is something the UK ICO also uh, pushed forward very much on this. Um, you know, I'm glad you point that. I'm glad you brought in the role of the ICO, right? Because I think that's a great illustration of the need and, and recognition of the need by policymakers and regulators that there that needs to be this holistic approach to design. So if we start from um, privacy yep. by design, there's this holistic approach, but there also has have to be the mechanisms for that collaboration. Um, do you do you see that happening either at a, you know at a, at a policy level or an implementation level, or, and and if not, what what needs to happen? So different, absolutely. So there's different approaches by the different regulators. So the UK ICO is very interested in supporting the development of privacy tech and priv tech, uh, but yeah. very much in in terms of supporting it rather than driving it themselves. Say France, for example, their data protection authority, as a small example, they issued a tool to be able to do data protection impact assessment and some put forward more prescriptive some are some are less prescriptive i think regulators on the whole though are trying to give more of a risk managed rule-based idea than the industry to see what comes out sort of the old idea of back in the days the early days of the internet in the u.s when it was like let's not over regulate it and strangle it at birth there's a lot of different ways people will come through from this and they're talking about banking also not being able to do it on their own if they're wanting a broader take up there was an interesting national audit uh, report on Verify, which was a UK government initiative uh, that would, they went to put into the wild, which had uh, it was criticised for not have for being a bit over ambitious and also not having a very far objective. And I think this all comes into the privacy uh, by default and by design because at the beginning you've got to say this is what we're going to do, and then you can do all your and your impact assessments off that and, and get the the individual rights encapsulated. So I think regulators are happy to see what through. Great, thank you. Vicky, I'd like to bring you in on this point actually around, you know, are the, are the regulators getting this balance right and are they getting the the mechanisms to design the regulatory framework right and between privacy and the use of data f for identity or whatever whatever purpose? Well, actually, the regulators should be and should stay uh, technologically neutral, so they are um, creating a framework, a legal framework, and uh, after that is the, the role and the mission of um, um, private and the public sector to find solutions that would mix uh, those uh, requirements. But um, thinking about um, digital identities and uh, the new framework and the role of uh, financial institutions, I think that uh, this is the, the moment, the excellent uh, time uh, to have um, a major switch from identity consumer to identity providers for uh, financial uh, sector and for banks generally. As uh, Manuela said, um, the banks have uh, are the um, 
are benefiting the, the trust of uh, their um, customers and they are dealing with um, a lot of uh, data of personal data but still we have assisting now at uh, um, different banks having the same set of data of the citizens in the case they have um, accounts open to uh, to uh, two or more uh, uh, banks so um, is that is the right time to uh, play an active role uh, for the financial institutions and to start using uh, that data they are uh, already uh, verified and collected uh, for the benefit of their uh, customers actually and uh, I think this is the uh, one of the biggest challenge for financial institutions in the in short time Manuela what do you think to that point by Vicky um, well, I think it's interesting, right? Because we've, we've got the assets. Uh, question is, how do we how do we make it work, uh, right? And um, I think, and you know, an important topic that we've been discussing uh, for for a really long time now is uh, the framework of liability, uh, right? Um, so banks are very, um, you know, diligent in what they do, but they also they don't. They are, you know, our compliance departments, they are so strict. Um, they would not want to engage with anything that could threaten us, right? Or expose data or, you know, if we share it, then how is it going to be shared? Um, and when we talk about, you know, the customer should own the data and, you know, about privacy and transparency, there's a little bit of a gap in the communication, right? We need to establish the core principles, but also figure out how can it actually work in the real world, right? One thing is to, to draw a nice picture, but the other one is to execute and get through all the governance. And that's where we've been working a lot and very hard. And it's, uh, it's a challenge, but it's an ongoing conversation. And, you know, given um, the digital economy, we understand that it has to be 100% digital, right? And, and governments understand that. So, you know, regulations might change and so might our position change, right? Absolutely, Brad, Brad. You know how how do those points someone whether fit with with your work around you know trust trust frameworks and liability models? Is, well, is look, there firstly, you echo share with us in terms of your thinking. Well, echo what uh, Manuela and Vicky have each described. I think um, in terms of of understanding the the challenge for regulators, I think there's a really key point of who are we talking about when we say the regulators? Because in the past we talked about a financial services regulator and there were some quite clear lanes and quite clear mandates for a banking regulator and alongside them an insurance regulator and perhaps the securities regulator and now all of that is intersected with this very co complex labyrinth where we have the mandate of a, a privacy commissioner and a competition commissioner some of which are often actually in, in competition or conflict with each other as well so you know we need to have some degree of, of patience or at least empathy with the regulators themselves that they're grappling with that and of course, we certainly at the IF and, and for global firms like Santander, you know, we like to look at this at a global or international level. And of course, all of those different mandate conflicts emerge within each jurisdiction. So they get even more complicated when you just uh, layer those up at the, the global level. So there is, I think, uh, you know, an important um, consideration that we need to recognise there. Specifically on liability, I, I think the you know, the, the key direction I, I favour is, look, look, let's not be adding liability. Let's, you know, th there is, if, if, if uh, information or data is passed and somebody identifies somebody to a particular level of, of satisfaction, like there's, there's a liability in the legal structures that applies today. Let's not add to that. Let's, let's confirm the, the levels that we have. But then that also perhaps helps to give the certainty that might enable the creation of other insurance products, for instance so that a firm may attest to the identity that they're passing and they might be able to, to uh, mobilise or design different insurance products that um, you know, transfer that liability or absolve that from the, uh, the other end of the transaction. So you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity for market development in that space if we, if we just have the sufficient certainty of the legal structure around liability. Um, and that's, I think, probably the direction I would favour. Great. And any other comments on that? 
I don't know, Don, what's, what's your view, particularly as someone who's sure. building? I mean, uh, yeah. No, I, it is a firm believer in the free market would provide solutions. Uh, Brad, spot on, you've got to have regulatory certainty, but you also have to be able to identify all the links in the chain and where that data is gone. You have to understand and have common accepted uh, ways of measuring the amount of risk. So if you think in the States, you have an SIPC or an FDIC, you have insurers that insure uh, consumers against a bank failing or an investor failing. You would very much need some sort of insurance policy specific to this that is based on the amount of data you hold, the risk in the data you hold and identifying each party. Once you have that kind of Venn diagram of all three pieces, I think it wouldn't be that difficult for an insurance market to then price it appropriately and then manage it because you could reduce your premiums by increasing your security. Um, you could, it would facilitate a lot of common interruption of data. It would help combat synthetic identity as well because you, you see the, the richer the data, the harder it is to spoof somebody. So I, I think the market can provide that. But as Brad said, you need some regulatory certainty to kind of get off the starting blocks. So it's quite interesting. Again, we come back to this market-led approach versus this kind of top, let's say top-down, maybe government-led approach. And I'm quite interested, Don, in your in your experience, right? So you're building, you know, you're building this consortium. You're building the, you know, the 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 standards around this um, to exchange information, provide that transparency you need to support, let's say, liability among other things. So, so at what point and where do you then engage? With the, or is that the regulators, or is that not you? Though? Who, who uses your infrastructure, if you like, to engage with the regulators you know, collaboratively? Oh, good question. Um, yeah. Good question. Even though we don't comment on policy and we don't lobby, we certainly do educate, and we have a mandate yeah. from our, our members to educate the lawmakers, policymakers, and even the press. On, on what it is we're doing, how we're helping them. It also, you know, it does help as a not-for-profit with no commercial interest. We can come with very clean hands saying, we don't, we're not going to make any money on this, um, but here's how it helps and here's things to consider. And it, actually, I have to give the regulators credit. They've been very mature about, okay, prove this out. Show us the data. Invariably, the last minute and a half of any conversation I have with any regulator is, good job, keep us informed, carry on. Until they, until they tell you to stop. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Any other comments on? Yeah, I would just, um, on the liability yeah. bit, it's quite interesting mm. that everyone's sort of talking about GDPR and as a, as a long time data protection lawyer, it's, it's fantastic because until GDPR in fines, uh, most people paid lip service to data protection laws and it was a cost of doing business because the fines were so low and no one really took it seriously. So GDPR has brought in this huge uh, level of fines and it's inspired, uh, laws around the world. I mean, California's privacy laws are very much inspired by GDPR and it's also Brazil and India and you can look in jurisdictions. But the liability is also there. I think the US has a particular look at liability, a particular view on liability in these and it can escalate very, very quickly. Um, in the, you know, the F look at the fines that the FTC's uh, handed out, out there, but much of the fines a lot of users have found out and there's a very different approach throughout Europe. So I think in terms of liability, there's a patchwork there and it's also changing quite quickly. So I have a lot of sympathy for firms in looking at trying to pin down what that liability is. But GDPR is also brought into your collection, quite like the US and that's sort of firms, BA, et cetera. So an area of moving, a moving feast for people to follow. Great. Well, look, I, we're in our conversation. It's been a great um, canter through all of the issues around you know beyond the technology around what does you know, how do we design and implement effective you know interoperable digital id systems that are that are safe um and secure in terms of protecting um individuals um entities and enabling trust and and i'm, I'm glad we ended on liability because um coming back to the beginning of our discussion when we looked at um scheme you know different schemes and shapes that issue around liability came up consistently as one of one of the the main challenges that's that's blocking the development and rollout of systems and you know it's great just to learn from this conversation um, that there's you know real hard work at the front end around how do we design systems but also 
get the collaboration model and, and engagement from the policy regulators as well as the you know the participants in those systems um, to try and and work through those systems because um, clearly we have to do that because we've seen that issue among a number of others that we've discussed as blockers but it's great to see a kind of coalescence around you know how how, how we actually overcome some of those challenges can move forward you know with implementing digital systems because i think of all we've all said today you know increasingly it's just clear that effective safe secure digital identity systems are foundational to so much in terms of just ongoing service reducing the cost but also the safety you know of financial services and beyond to other services as well so thank you all very much it's been a it's been a pleasure to um facilitate this discussion uh, very grateful um for everyone's contribution so thank you very much and thank you very much to everybody um watching our conversation.